So, in uh, these uh, set of lectures uh, which are related to rotational rheometry, uh, we will look at uh, the uh, how uh, closely we can uh, match the experimental conditions uh, that we use as rheologists to what is the what are the theoretical assumptions which are used in analyzing the phenomena. Uh, for example, we have seen that uh, there will be shear flow that we will say we are going to conduct. Now, how uh, closely is the flow shear flow only? So, that there are no extensional components. So, that has to be ensured when we do shear flow experiments because all our analysis will be based on the assumption that there are no extensional components during the flow. So, how closely are we mimicking that situation uh, in an experimental condition? And uh, so, closely we, we need to be always aware of what are all the assumptions that have gone on to one particular type of measurement and uh, ensure through experimental protocols uh, that we are as close to those assumptions as possible. And uh, more importantly, if uh, we do let us say rheometry experiments and we get the data, can we by going through the data recognize if there is something which is experimental artifact. So, artifact arises because uh, the assumptions that we made are being violated. One simple thing could be let us say no slip at the wall of the rheometer geometries. Most of our analysis we will assume uh, no slip, but if material starts slipping to some degree because quite often the material may not slip perfectly. So, then uh, there will be certain uh, then we will say that oh my data. So, we can start interpreting let us say whatever material function we measure and start interpreting various things and we will say it is related to structure, but actually it is related to the slip. So, therefore, we need to make sure that uh, we are aware of all the assumptions that are involved in uh, calculation of material function and more importantly if we get the data we should be able to analyze so that we should be able to figure out if there is an artifact which is there in the data. Effectively uh, we will need to again look at how material functions are defined. So, we will go through one example of a cone and plate uh, viscometer and uh, the measurement of viscosity. So, that uh, fluid mechanically we will see what are all the assumptions and then uh, we will come back and then see that when I do experiment when I load fluid into the cone and plate geometry what are all possible ways in which I can violate those assumptions and what kind of artifacts will that lead to. So, this is the overall scheme for the next uh, few lectures in which we will discuss rotational rheometry. So, first uh, in this segment we will go through the uh, summary of all the material functions that we have defined so far in the course. So, we will look at rotational rheometry generally and then look at summary of material functions and uh, then uh, in the next uh, segments we will look at cone and plate uh, geometry and its fluid mechanical solution. So, we have been following this uh, overall uh, approach. Uh, in looking at uh, the rheological response, we have said that uh, we will look at qualitatively the response through these different uh, uh, types of response. So, we try to characterize whether it is a viscoelastic response, whether uh, thixotropic or yield stress material. Uh, uh, so, depending on this then we can then uh, investigate and uh, uh, find out which material functions are useful. And so, to do quantification we use the material functions. And then of course, uh, we are also parallelly always looking at uh, some constitutive model which helps us explain. So, for stress relaxation we saw uh, Maxwell model, for uh, creep we saw standard linear solid model, for normal stress differences we saw upper convected Maxwell model. So, there was always one simple model which was useful for us to show the material function that we were trying to understand. So, we will continue and uh, so, basically the material functions which are uh, quantitative measurement of material response uh, are based on uh, analysis of a rheometric flow. So, this rheometric flow could be uh, based on the type of flow that we have uh, decided to impose on the material. Uh, given a type of flow there are still possibilities of several geometries. So, just because we decide a type it need not 
uh, frees us into one particular geometry. For example, shear can be imposed we have seen already in cone and plate, it could be parallel plate. It, so, there are several possibilities as far as imposing shear is concerned. Similarly, even if we do extensional flow, uh, we can do it uh, in the form of uh, uniaxial or biaxial, it can be a cylindrical rod. So, there are various possibilities of doing uh, the various geometries that can be chosen to impose a particular type of flow. And then of course, based on these two, we uh, finally define very precisely what a material function is. And uh, uh, of course, from an experimental or analysis point of view, we are controlling some variable and measuring some other variable. So, we saw that in a stress relaxation experiment, uh, we will control strain and strain will be can be controlled using position. And of course, what we will be measuring is either a force or a torque. Uh, if we are doing a creep experiment, then maybe torque and force is being controlled and position or a rate of movement will be measured. So, either of these variables will either be a measured variable and the others will be controlled variable. So, depending on what is the nature of uh, uh, rheometric flow that we have decided, we will choose one of these set of uh, measurement variables and control variables. And uh, this is uh, something very important in terms of understanding the rheometer response also. So, there are some rheometers which naturally are better in terms of controlling the position or the strain, while some there are some other rheometers which are far better in terms of controlling the force depending on the make of the rheometer and what is the overall uh, sensing elements as well as the operating elements in it. So, therefore, so you will hear of strain controlled rheometers or stress controlled rheometers. So, therefore, it is uh, better for us to know what is the control variable and what is the measured variable. So, if on a stress controlled rheometer if you control strain it can be done, but we must always be aware that may be the con since the basic uh, rheometer is made in a way that it controls stress, strain control can happen only if feedback is done. So, what the instrument will try to do is apply a little bit of stress, then measure strain and let us say we have asked it to do 5 percent strain. So, it will apply some strain and then it will uh, see what uh, it will apply some stress, see what is the strain and it will realize oh it is not 5, then it will go back and change that stress. So, therefore, there is a feedback loop through which it will control. So, therefore, these measurement and control uh, variables are also important for us to note when we are looking at uh, rheological analysis. And of course, uh, based on if we have done our uh, analysis of rheometric flow correctly, decided the type properly, made sure the geometry is uh, well defined and therefore, definition of material functions is quite clear and if we are able to measure and control variables appropriately, then we can estimate the material function quantitatively and hopefully in this estimate therefore, there may not be many artifacts. So, now let us look at each of these three, uh, the type of flow for example, can be shear flow, it can be extensional flow, extensional flow as we saw uh, can be done in lubricated squeeze flow also, which we have discussed earlier. We can take the material between two plates and squeeze and have the plates lubricated, so that material slips. So, this is another example where uh, an artifact can arise. So, if let us say we ensure slip by applying either a uh, waxy coating or maybe a Teflon uh, plates, so that hydrophilic uh, materials will slip, but the slip may not be perfect. There may be little bit of no slip or little bit of sticking. So, therefore, we will have to do many times more systematic experiments. We may have to change the rate of squeezing we may have to apply our uh, slipping coating two, three different way or maybe use two, three different surfaces and then analyze and make sure that the assumption of perfect slip is being obeyed. In all of this of course, as rheologists we always also test with standard fluids. There are always standard fluids available and for which we know completely the, what the response is. So, generally we also tend to put the standard fluids in the rheometer and then analyze the response and make sure that we are getting the response that is expected. And uh, once we decide the type of flow, there are various other assumptions that go into the analysis. For example, we may assume that flow is only one dimensional, 
uh, we will uh, more often than not assume that it is very low Reynolds number. Quite often we are looking at very thin gaps in the rheometer. Uh, so, if the diameter of the cylinder is 50 mm, the uh, gap between the uh, in the annular region may be only 1 mm. So, therefore, it is a very thin gap. Cone and plate, uh, the separation between cone and plate is in microns, 50 microns or 100 micrometers. So, therefore, it is a very thin gap uh, and that is the characteristic dimension in defining Reynolds number. So, therefore, Reynolds number is quite often low. Reynolds number is also low because uh, quite often these complex materials have high nominal viscosity. Their viscosity is generally definitely an order of magnitude or even more higher than water. So, generally viscosity is high, the dimensions are low. So, Reynolds number ends up being very small, but in all analysis this is very crucial. So, quite often in rheometer uh, operation you will hear that inertial effects are important. So, we may do for example, an oscillatory shear and we may get g prime as a function of frequency and then uh, looking at the data especially at high frequency somebody may opine that oh looks like your high frequency data is suspect there may be inertial effects. And so, inertial effects will be important wherever Reynolds number is significant. So, we need to ensure that the Reynolds number is sufficiently low and therefore, uh, the fluid inertia or the material inertia is not playing a big role or not playing a substantial role or significant role. So, that you can ignore it and therefore, measure properties the way we are meaning to do. So, low Reynolds number, narrow gap uh, are uh, analysis uh, assumptions which are always done. Similarly, there is uh, can be an assumption of quasi steady. So, the squeeze flow that I mentioned, uh, it is actually uh, depending on uh, how the analysis is done. Uh, if you do let us say squeeze flow which is not lubricated, then the material does not really slip. So, for example, this also we have seen uh, as one of the examples that if you have a parallel plate and uh, the plate is moving down and then if you have let us say a, a fluid here, then the fluid will uh, start moving radially outward. So, if you look at it from top, uh, basically you since you are pushing the fluid below, the fluid will be moving in all radial direction. And uh, in this case, uh, you can uh, actually the plate is being pushed continuously. So, therefore, uh, there is a uh, velocity of the plate. So, this plate is being pushed down with a velocity. Now, how to analyze this problem? So, we quite often use an assumption called quasi steady. So, we will say that at one instant of time, if this velocity is specified, let me try to find what is the velocity profile. Because remember the shear is happening in this region, shear is happening here and in the end this is the velocity profile that we are, we are uh, interested in finding out. So, what we say is we will assume uh, as if the plate is coming step by step instead of continuously and we can attempt solution at each and every stage. And of course, we know that uh, overall things are dependent on time because plate is continuously moving and therefore, velocity predicted here will also be continuously changing, but we seek a solution by saying we will assume quasi steady operation. So, as if in one instant of time material flow at least within the geometry the radial flow is going to be steady flow and yeah. Uh, then uh, de depending on the uh, rate of motion of the plate, uh, the assumptions that we apply here may or may not be valid, right. If, if plate is moving too fast. Because mainly quasi steady is used for uh, isothermal process, temperature remain constant. Right, yeah. So, quasi isothermal or yeah. So, any time there is a or, or for example, in thermodynamics, we sometimes use the quasi equilibrium. So, we say that uh, when the system is evolving from one state to another, we realize that it will go away from equilibrium, but instead we assume that it is going through steps which are very incremental and in each case it never goes too far away from equilibrium. So, the here also it is similar assumption. So, even if the let us say the rate is very fast, as long as uh, the fluid flow 
is only in radial direction then we are okay again. So, it uh, depends on what is the behavior of the system. It need not mean that if, if a system in case of equilibrium uh, quasi equilibrium assumption also the rate is not determining factor in determining how far away from equilibrium you have gone. Similarly, in this case also whether the plate is moving too fast or slow will not necessarily determine whether we can make quasi steady assumption or not. It is more dependent on how the velocity profile looks like. For example, if it is at some rate rather than uh, going like this, if uh, let us say the fluid uh, velocity profile ends up being for some reason because of uh, the rate at which it is moving, if uh, fluid is uh, moving something like this right that it uh, starts acquiring a z motion which is much more significant or because of the way the plate is being pushed there is instability and uh, when you look at from top the fluid in addition to moving in uh, r direction it is also moving in theta direction. So, these are the assumptions uh, which are uh, completely going to break down. So, in that case there is no point mentioning quasi steady because everything depends on time and the detailed flow profiles is very different compared to what we are trying to analyze. So, therefore, there is a whole lot of assumption regarding type of flow that go into analyzing and making sure that we have a rheometric flow. Uh, the other important choice is of course, uh, a given type of flow can be uh, done in several types of geometries. So, throughout the course we have uh, discussed cone and plate and parallel plate quite significantly. There are also concentric cylinders, so which is uh, where uh, we choose two cylinders and then uh, one of them uh, is rotating. So, it is also called cup and bob. So, we have an annular region in which fluid is placed. So, this is where uh, fluid is placed and then the, the geometry is uh, rotated. So, in, in this case uh, do you have uh, any uh, 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 idea about whether uh, if let us say we have the option of rotating the cup and rotating the bob which is better for us to rotate. Yeah, why, why is that? Why is it uh, in the sense uh, one can do rotation of the see in the end the it is only relative velocity between these two moving surfaces. Yes. So, for example, even if you have let us say the parallel plate example that we have been discussing in class quite often if this is moving with velocity v the same thing can be achieved by saying that this is moving with velocity v and this is moving with velocity v right there is the same identical flow because rest of it is rigid body translation right. The same thing could also be done by saying that this plate is stationary while this plate is moving to the left with v. So, all of these are identical uh, situation in which basically relative velocity between the two plates is v. So, from a fluid mechanical point of view all of these are uh, identical situations. So, similarly in this cup and bob also uh, we can have the cup rotating or the bob rotating. So, which one uh, would be better and why is a good question to ask. So, any any idea about rotating how you will control normally in these cases that the rotation will be no. So, you can uh, for example, this can be also uh, mounted on a shaft and this is also mounted on a shaft right. So, uh, uh, of course, one thing is you can have motor here this will be connected to motor right alternately this can also be connected to motor. No, sir, then uh, that height also that liquid height uh, huh. how much we are feeling in case of bob things I think. Uh, you both cases we can I mean so this is the level to which you, you will usually. Uh, so, there will in such cup and bob geometry there will always be a level indicator to say that uh, you should fill up to that level because the assumption again will be that shearing is happening throughout the geometry. What do you mean by fluid surface is too much? Uh, see because uh, you remember that this is uh, 
what we have always said is let us say if this is R1 and uh, this is R2 then generally the R2 minus R1 will be much less than R1 or R2 right because it is a thin gap we, we would like to have uh, it will take the load of the liquid also uh -huh, okay. So, but uh, uh -huh. yeah. So, will the stress, uh, so are you saying the stress will be more here as opposed to here? Yeah, but uh, what, what will be the incremental difference in the torques? Okay, so maybe the torque, uh, uh, first of all, you we will have to ensure that is the torque different. So, for example, in the earlier case that I showed, in this case, whether we are moving them in the uh, uh, this top plate in the uh, positive direction or the bottom plate in the negative direction, the torque requirements will be entirely identical. Right. In this case, there is no difference. So, that is the question we are also asking that uh, in, in this case also, if we have the uh, one option is that the inner uh, rotates in one direction or the same rate the outer one rotates. And uh, But uh, one possibility is because there is a uh, difference, right? the perimeter in the two cases are different and that is why you are saying in one case it will be 2 pi r 1, in the other case it will be 2 pi r 2 and of course, the L. L is the length, so this L is the length and so therefore, uh, 2 pi r 1 L and 2 pi r 2 L will be the two surfaces. So, possibly there may be uh, differences of torque, what, what other factor would there be? Ah, so, that, that we have already said, so torque related, surface area related, so all of these are related to one set of factors. Ha, so, resistance, torque, surface area, all of them are related to the fact that more surface area is there on the outer plate. What other factor could uh, be there in terms of defining the, uh -huh. so will slipping be affected based on whether we rotate the outer geometry or whether inner geometry? The outer is rotating, the, the velocity profile near the inner should be 0, isn't it? Yes. Uh, but uh, so you are you are uh, so so then we should uh, we should qualify that statement by saying that it's possible that the slip characteristics may depend on uh, velocity and uh, it is likely that if velocities are higher slip may happen right in that case but then uh, inner plate will also have the slip because we are going to rotate both of them yeah, yeah. So, if, if at all there is a, so, so quite often you may have a case where slip velocity let us say depends on, uh, uh, slip velocity depends on, uh, depends on uh, solid surface velocity, right. But then uh, both inner and outer surfaces are going to be identical. So, either we will have slip at the inner surface, if we do rotate outer we will have uh, uh, slip at the outer surface. So, therefore, that difference may not uh, translate much, is there any other factor? Mm, that is on the, if outer top means it will take the load of the liquid also. Uh, but that is in the vertical direction, right. Uh, so, so, if at a, yeah, so and the other thing is given that it is a thin gap, the amount of fluid is going to be small. Right. So, but yeah, it is true that uh, in this direction there will be gravitational load which this shaft will have to withstand. So, so that will be there, but uh, we expect that load to be uh, not very significant. So, weight of the fluid uh, is there and uh, that will be there on the cup, right. The cup will have to withstand. Exactly. Uh -huh. fluid, whatever we are taking, uh -huh. that density may not same for all. Uh -huh, but uh, yeah, so the what is, but only thing is the torque is being measured in uh, this direction and weight is in the other direction. So, therefore, the weight even if it is different and even if we do not know the density of the fluid very well, it is not going to contribute in the torque direction. 
One other factor that you could have is what if your uh, motor efficiency is different for different weight. So that, but generally we will choose a motor for rheometer which at least for a good range of uh, weights will work well. So that we are able to transmit the load that we want or we are able to rotate it at the rate we want for a given set of weights. So it is hopefully not that uh, sensitive to that uh, contribution, though it can be one factor. What, what else could be? So if uh, maybe just to uh, look at uh, what direction is the flow in? Theta direction, right? The flow is only in theta direction. So if we the inner case is rotating, then uh, the velocity will be something like this, right? and it will go down to 0 at the outer surface and uh, if we have the other way where the outer surface is rotating then it will be like this right. Sir if the outer is rotating then there is more radial direct chance of radial flow because huh. more. Yeah so is, is that uh, so in fact that is the reason I wanted you to think of from the beginning right that is why I have been asking more and more as to. So now as soon as I draw this it becomes clear that in one case uh, we see the theta direction motion is perfectly fine that is what we want. We do not want fluid to be moving in radial direction but we always know that whenever there is a V theta motion there is always V theta square by R is the centrifugal uh, centripetal uh, forces in the radial direction. Uh, so it will start having flow in uh, in fact R direction. Yeah, it will it will start getting basically V R V theta, and in fact V Z also. What will happen is uh, if I draw, let's say, the annular gap again. So let's say this is the annular gap. This is the inner cylinder. So this is R one and this is R two, and ideally we are hoping that fluid is moving only in theta direction. So let's say it is going inside the. So therefore, I am drawing it like this. I hope you are all familiar that this means that fluid is moving in theta direction. But let us say because of this motion and uh, R, this fluid element starts moving in R direction. Then what will happen is since it will encounter the wall, it will have to also come back and it may we may get a roll like that. So the if you look at it from top, what will happen is a fluid element uh, which is let us say in this annular region will be moving like this. Right, it is moving in the radial direction also and uh, in theta direction of course it will be moving because we are rotating one of them. Similarly when I look in z it is also moving in z direction. So the basic uh, analysis uh, point that we had that look we are only imposing theta motion and velocity has to be only in theta direction will be very severely violated if we have this kind of a breakage. And so from that point of view at least looks like that to minimize the inertial forces. In fact this is an example of inertial force. So rho v theta squared by r will be the inertial term. So it is better for us to have v theta high for lower r. Uh, 